Good morning. We're going to get started relatively quickly here because the kids have to get back. So um, students, you should be signing in because we are taking attendance in case this runs over. We'll make sure you're excused uh, for your next class. Um, so get settled. <laughs> I'm Cindy Rivera. I'm the uh, department chair for the school counseling office, and we're so excited to invite these wonderful people here to give us a, um, some insight on applying to UK schools. Um, it will be recorded, I believe. Somebody hit record. I think they did that back there. Um, but also, we're going to um, s start the program. I'm going to have everybody introduce themselves and then uh, we'll go over things. There'll be plenty of time for questions. Um, students, if you need to go back at, at 9.50, we should be just about done at that point anyway for the, with the presentation, so it, it should be fine. And, but if you want to stay a little bit longer, you, the attendants will take care of that. Okay, so I'm going to have everyone introduce themselves. Good, hello. <laughs> Hi, everyone. Oh, sorry. Um, my name's Caroline. I'm from the University of Liverpool in the northwest of England. Um, it's great to be here. Thank you for having us. Hi, I'm Chris. I'm from uh, Lancaster University, also in the northwest of England. Uh, it's great to be here. Thank you. Hello, everyone. My name is Sophie. I am from Northumbria University in Newcastle in the northeast of England. Hi everybody, my name is Haley Drogas and I am representing University of Sheffield, which is in central England. So we have a map for you just in case you're not familiar with the locations. Um, so yeah, let's get started. Yeah. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> yeah. Early start. Um, okay, so jumping right in, what can you expect if you study in England? So three-year degrees are, of course, a huge opportunity. Um, no gen ed courses, so you jump right in, and for three straight years, you take um, courses that pertain to the course or program that you choose. So um, there's sometimes opportunities um, with the uh, compulsory courses versus not compulsory to be able to dabble in other things but for the most part no gen ed you jump right in um, and you are done in three years which is a great opportunity if you're looking to then further your studies you just don't want to be in a school for four whole years or it's also a great opportunity to save money because that essentially saves a quarter of the cost of studying in a country including our own here in the US that is a four-year degree uh, and then in terms of picking your major and starting to study from day one, like I said, you jump right in truly. Um, no intro courses. We do have a few options for those at um, the bulk of the institutions in the UK and ours where you might um, be able to have more of an intro start. But for the most part, our students apply and then start with the three-year degree. And then we have direct entry um, into professional courses. So medicine, uh, you jump right in from the start and it is a five-year course. And then you graduate and you have your medical degree. And then for law, three years. So rather than having to complete here in the US a four-year bachelor's and then go into law school for an additional few years, uh, it is a three-year course in the UK. And then uh, we have very transparent entry requirements, which I think um, benefits everybody. So um, in terms of knowing what you need to submit, knowing what you need to get into or onto a certain course at a certain institution, it's all very transparent. Whether you're working with one of us or you simply go view that course's page on our university's websites, um, it's all right there um, and clear as day. And if there are any questions, that's what we're here for. And then we have uh, the opportunity for students to work with a personal tutor. Now, in the US, even if a university has that option, lots of times it's just for the academic component. In the UK, it covers everything. So they'll work with you if you are um, struggling with mental health issues, if you are dyslexic. Anything and everything, that tutor is there for you, um, including ac the academic component. And then, 
just the, there we go. And then um, continuing on to this topic, so it is very cost effective. I already mentioned that it is a three-year bachelor's typically instead of the four, um, so that's already saving a major cost, um, but then overall the tuition fees themselves can generally be lower than what you'd find in the United States. And again, back to that word transparency, all of the tuitions, the fees, they're all very transparent. You won't get there and find out, oh, the art school has an additional fee that I have to pay every quarter or every term uh, for resources in that school. So um, as an example, so it, you know up front, you know what you have to pay, which is nice. And then, um, let's see, what did I miss here? Thank you, federal loans. Want to make sure I'm on the right line. Um, so in terms of federal loans, we are all FAFSA eligible. So if you are planning to utilize FAFSA, federal loan funding from the United States to study um, and earn your undergraduate degree, you can still do that. Unfortunately, we are not grant eligible. So if you are considering the opportunity for something like a Pell Grant, you know, it makes sense. The United States wants you to use that money in country, right? So unfortunately, we're not eligible for those. But FAFSA, we are. We also have scholarships available. Um, you won't really find a full ride, unfortunately. But we do have a lot of opportunities. Lots of times they're um, merit-based. They might be per specific course. So it's best to look on our websites or just ask us. And then um, in terms of accommodation, everyone gets their own bedroom, which I find that you know, that's a great opportunity for students to be able to really focus and not have to worry about, you know, if they might not get along with their roommate, not to scare any of the students, that won't always happen, but maybe you're, you know, you do best when you have your quiet time and you have your own area to study and complete your assignments, projects, studying, um, so you have that, which is really nice. It also helps um, with launching you into being more independent. And then um, completion rates, we are very proud to say it is over 80% um, at our universities in the UK in terms of uh, retaining students and completing your degrees on time. And then uh, we are, of course, very rich in cultural heritage, um, international experience. Uh, you know, we're all very diverse schools, which is great. And then, of course, we're a gateway to Europe. So it's easily accessible to get to other parts. Oops, sorry, jump right there. Thank you very much, Haley. Um, so I'm just going to talk for a few slides about um, finding the right fit and is the UK a good choice for you? Okay, so um, five main things to consider really. I'm just gonna kinda like go through these. Uh, so first of all, we've got academic profile. So what we mean by that is are the universities that you're looking at in the UK potentially, um, are the subjects, um, have you already kinda like got the right background or will you be progressing to the right background for that so a lot of our courses for example in the uk they'll require certain grades they might not require any specific subjects however for quite a lot of our subjects particularly within the sciences they'll be looking have you studied for example physics before chemistry biology so these are all widely available on university websites but it's a really important thing to research beforehand some universities might ask for standardized tests some might not so again a really important thing to explore Academic motivation as well. Is there a particular career, a particular job that you're looking for afterwards? Um, if you want to be an architect later on, then maybe biomedicine isn't the right fit for you, like um, just to start off with. However, like a lot of um, degree courses as well will offer a lot of transferable skills. So even if you're not sure what career afterwards, a degree in the UK is extremely worthwhile. Outside the classroom, when you come to like study a degree in the UK, it's not just about getting that piece of paper at the end, you know, saying after three years, I know a lot about this subject. It's about the entire experience as well. Are you already engaged with sports and would you like to keep that up at university? In which case you might want to go to a university with a really strong sporting background. Um, alternatively, you know, you might want a city that's got a lot of like cultural and historical worth as well. These are all important things to consider too. Um, and it's really, really great to like look into these as well so that it's not just the course that's a great fit for you, but it's the city and the university itself. Learning styles. So um, again, going back to like scientific subjects, a lot of these will have big practical components. You know, you'll be working in laboratories um, or maybe in field courses, for example. 
Uh, we do have in the UK, again, as Hayley mentioned, there's a very strong emphasis on independent learning as well. So if this excites you and kind of like you really like the prospects of independent learning, then the UK is a great, great fit for you. Uh, and then finally as well, personal characteristics. This kind of like ties in with everything else really. Um, if the idea of kind of like traveling to a different country is interesting um, to you, if that, again, that sort of like independent focus on learning feels like a good fit, then looking into UK universities such as ourselves, um, it's probably a really, really good idea. So, and for this one, uh, so entry requirements again, as I mentioned, a lot of um, a lot of courses will require specific subjects. It's always good to kind of like brush up on those first, and again, be realistic about what grades they're asking for. Um, a module and course structure as well. So with this um, at, at universities, you will have courses broken down into kind of like specific modules as well. Um, I won't go into too much detail about that, but it's a way of kind of like picking out areas um, that uh, that are specific to each different course as well. Reputation, so, dif uh, so different universities will have different rankings as well. I'll touch on that in, in a moment. Um, placement in internships as well. So it's not just about the degree course. You'll also have the opportunity to maybe get work experience, either um, as a full year in industry um, or as internships maybe across the summers of your degree course as well. These are great ways to like strengthen your CV afterwards too. Professional accreditation. Uh, you know, like things like architecture, like business, it's really, really good to, to have like professional accreditation. This is shown by universities um, and, and it will also show like afterwards once you've achieved your degree that, you know, you've studied at a university which has already been verified um, as an institution that, no, that fully knows these areas do. I won't go on just about everything else, but again, careers and employability, distinctive opportunities as well. These are... Um, Sorry, stripping over my words. Um, <laughs> so for careers and employability, again, it's good to look at the links that, that universities have so that once you graduate, you can look into like the jobs and roles that you'll be able to pick up afterwards as well. Okay, and finally for me, again, just some last minute things to consider as well. Location in the UK, do you want somewhere that's close to an airport, for example? Um, the size and the type of university, so for example, some of our universities are based within cities. Some are kind of like outside of cities as well, be massive parkland campus universities. Um, accommodation, as Hayley mentioned, in the UK you will have your own room. If that's something that appeals, then again, the UK is a great fit. Facilities, and then support as well. So uh, learning support and, like, and, and also support with transitioning to a new country as well is something that's really, really key to us here. Um, we, do, we do offer that from fully trained professionals as well. It, it won't just be your personal tutor, it'll be a whole host of staff who are available to assist um, during your university experience. And again, those extracurricular opportunities as well, such as sports, such as music, the opportunity to really participate and kind of like build up your social network whilst you're here in the UK. Okay, and the last minute thing as well is researching options. So. Um, with this, as you can see, as, as I mentioned, rankings are a really, really key thing to kind of like look into. Different, you know, um, different ranking systems will rank different uh, universities in a variety of ways, not just by the universities themselves, but by the courses. So it's good to look at kind of like different examples for those. Um, another invaluable resource, online forums. So obviously it's great to look into rankings and look at the universities there, but also actually hearing from students, particularly those um, who have maybe like come from overseas, who have similar experiences to those that, that you will potentially be looking into, um, is absolutely fantastic. A lot of universities as well on their websites, you'll potentially have the opportunity to chat with international students as well um, and, re and get their opinion too, both on the things that they found really positive and maybe some things that you know they might have found difficult and advice that they can give with regards to those difficulties. Okay, so I'm just gonna hand over to Caroline now. Thanks. Um, so apologies in advance for the boring section about the application process, but I think it's important that you at least have some awareness of how the admissions process works in the UK because it is very different from how it works in the US. 
Um, so first of all, we have um, a common application system uh, in the UK, um, but it's um, we use one system for all of the university applications. They all go through something called UCAS, which is Universities and Colleges Admission Service. So there is one single application which gets sent to five choices. So you have a maximum of five choices. And that's five choices in terms of the course that you're applying to. So if you've got your heart set on one particular university, you can actually use all five choices for that university, but diff just different courses. We wouldn't recommend that. We think you need to keep variety in your options open. But it does allow you to just focus in on one actual application, and then that same application is sent to all five universities. That means there's only one application fee as well, which is great, which we think is a, a reasonable price. Um, and um, it means that once that application is submitted, it goes to the five choices at the same time and will be considered by those five choices together. We do have certain deadlines in place for our application system. Um, and uh, these will be... Um, we tend to have uh, mostly open applications throughout the cycle, so from September until June, but some universities might close their application earlier. Just one date I want to pick out, though, is that if the last Wednesday in January is, something, is the deadline for what we call equal consideration. What this means is that basically if a university receives an application by this deadline, they are obliged to review and consider that application. So they can't turn around and say, you know what, we've already got lots of applications, we're not going to consider this, they have to, we have to. Um, so a lot of students will aim for this equal consideration deadline, but it's not necessarily a cut off, completely closed deadline. Um, so it does mean that students can apply after the January deadline if, for example, you, you're not prepared or you're not quite certain what you want to do, you don't feel ready to submit the application. A lot of universities will still accept applications right up until the end of June. Um, I think it's worth always speaking with the counselling team um, that you have here in the school because um, there may be internal deadlines for the school. Maybe they would prefer to get the applications in perhaps before Christmas break, for example, so that you feel that you know, you've got that confidence that it's ready to go. So you may have your own internal deadlines here. Um, there are some exceptions to the deadline. So, for example, if you're wanting to apply to Oxford or Cambridge, there is an actual cutoff, which is mid-October. This year is the 16th. Um, and the same for clinical programmes in the UK. So medicine, dentistry or vet science, again, it's the same um, deadline. Um, if you are considering applying for clinical programmes, you actually can only apply for medicine, for example, with four choices. So you are limited, and then you would use your fifth choice for a different subject area. But I don't want to get into too much um, detail uh, with that um, right now. Um, in terms of what the application actually looks like, I'll just run through this list of the content. So we'd be looking for the personal details and previous education section, um, academic records, so um, things like transcripts, high school diploma, any standardised tests that you may have already taken. We, we you know, welcome that information as well. Um, predicted grades is something that we discuss um, you know, with the, with the counselling team, but this is something that's a bit different. Essentially in the UK, because a large part of the admissions process is based on academic level ability and profile, we um, request that the schools um, provide us with predicted grades so that we can see whether the student is going to be at the appropriate level to cope with the studies within the UK. Because as Haley's already mentioned, we go directly into that specialised subject. We don't have the gen ed so we do need to make sure that students are at the the relevant level in the uk we have a 13 year school system so the students in the uk have already done that extra year of studies there will be a teacher and counselor reference as well and then a personal statement and um, the personal statement is a bit like your college essay um, where we want to know more about um, you as an individual what your academic motivation is so why you've chosen the subject that you're interested in as well as you know any extracurriculars any experiences that you've got that you feel would um, give you a strong application um, for that university and the applications are read by our central admissions team um, and sometimes the departmental admissions tutors. Um, sometimes there are additional requirements. So if you're applying for an art or design course, we'd want a portfolio submitted. Um, sometimes there are interviews, particularly for the more competitive courses. Um, and obviously performing arts would require an audition. Hi, everyone. This is Mr. Regan. Excellent job on the broadcast. We still have academic time, so students can go... Uh, visit teacher, you must sign in if you leave your classroom. 
So please sign in with whatever classroom you go to. You're always welcome to stay in the classroom you are in. This is not passing time, so please make sure you are only leaving your classroom if you are going to another classroom for academic support of some sort. So we have 13 minutes still left of academic time, so please go see a teacher if you need to. Otherwise, stay in your classroom. Once again, thank you, NCTV. Great broadcast. Right, I'll carry on. Um, this is just to show you the application timeline. I won't talk through each section, but basically the application's open in September. We've got a few deadlines in place, as I mentioned already. Um, and universities will make their decisions um, as they go along. So we receive an application in September. We will review that immediately. We won't hold it back. Um, and, uh, you know, so students will find out probably at different rates um, from the five choices that they've applied to, depending on the volume of applications as well. Um, I'm going to hand over to Sophie now um, for a student life intro, but if you have any specific questions about the application process, you are welcome to, to ask questions afterwards as well. Great. Thank you. And now the fun part. Um, so yeah, obviously you're at university to study and you're supposed to be, you know, focusing on your academics, but in order to have a healthy mind and a healthy body, you have to have a social life and you have to have some hobbies and fun things that you're doing alongside your studies as well. Um, and the UK does obviously offer a uh, kind of very various opportunities for that. Like we've already mentioned with the fact that um, the UK degrees are normally relying on you doing a lot of independent study. It does also mean that you have a lot more time to yourself um, so um, depending on the subject that you're studying of course I mean you might have classes 9 to 5 Monday to Friday but you might have a lot more flexibility in that so um, you might have just let's say 20 hours a week of actual study time where you're supposed to be in lectures or seminars or kind of on campus and the rest of the time you are doing a lot of independent research, um, reading materials, doing kind of homework, if you will, a lot of these different things. But obviously, if you can manage your time well, it does also leave you uh, with quite a lot of flexible time to then be doing more um, sociable things. And um, so universities normally have something called the Students' Union, and they are kind of like an independent organization that works with the university, normally run by the students. Um, and they put on things like clubs and societies um, and like sports teams and things like that. Those are run by the Students' Union. And um, so as a student, you're always allowed to kind of join as many as you want, whatever you've got time for and you've got interests in. Um, normally when university starts, there's that first kind of welcome week that we call Freshers Week, and that's where you get um, a chance to get introduced to all the different clubs and societies and have a look around, have a chat with people who are already running those clubs and see if there's any that you'd want to join as well. Um, so there's some really nice opportunities, obviously, to meet new people, maybe learn some new skills, or if you've already got hobbies that you want to continue during university, you can be doing so as well. Um, the UK, when you come to the UK as an international student, you have a student visa that you need to apply for, and that allows you to work uh, up to 20 hours per week uh, during term time. And then outside of term time, so during summer and Christmas breaks, you're allowed to work unlimited hours as well. So if you do want to be working part time, that's also a possibility. Um, you might be working on campus. A lot of universities have jobs that you can be doing as a student. So you might be, for example, a student rep or a student ambassador, uh, going to events, talking about your time at the university, how much you've loved it, hopefully, if you have. Um, or you can also be working outside of campus. So there's no limitations in terms of you have to work on campus or anything like that. So like um, if you're at a city center campus, you can go work in like a clothing store or a restaurant or wherever. Um, if you've got a kind of more like campus-based um, university that's a bit further from the city, a lot of the time they then have a lot of different shops and things on campus that you can have been, uh, be working at as well. Um, obviously, sports is quite a big thing. Uh, maybe not as big as it is in the US. You know, you wouldn't maybe have like 10,000 people going to see a high school game or anything like that. But we do have sports in the UK as well, a uh, very kind of active um, varsity teams and, you know, kind of that similar sporting style as well. Um, so if you do want to be continuing a sport that you're already doing or you want to join a kind of more casual club um, all the way up to kind of more elite performance sports as well, there are lots of plenty, uh, plenty of opportunities for that as well. Um, the UK is also really well connected to um, obviously other places in the UK, but also to Europe as well. And we find that a lot of our students do like to travel um, around the UK. There's a lot of places to explore or then kind of um, the wider European countries because they're obviously very easy to get to and just hop around um, during your holidays and breaks. 
Um, what else is there? Have I missed anything? Yes, yeah, so obviously accommodation, like we've said, um, a lot of the time the accommodation itself will be um, either on campus or close by to campus, and we obviously, you know, kind of help you get around and that kind of thing, but um, one thing that I think a lot of students are quite worried about when they're first arriving in the UK is kind of what do I have to bring with me, you know, do I have to kind of move my whole life over, um, but obviously, you know, there'll be plenty of shops and restaurants and stores and everything for you when you get to the UK as well, so bring your kind of essentials, toiletries, maybe clothing for a few different weather opportunities in case uh, you get to the UK and you've come from like a hot place where you're not so used to the weather that we experience. Not that the UK weather is bad, I'm just saying. Um, and actually, uh, um, the UK, honestly, I've uh, lived there for 14 years now. I'm from Finland originally, and I think the UK's got really lovely weather. It's a total myth. Um, if you go to like certain places, maybe Glasgow's a bit rainier than other places, but Glasgow's a lovely place, don't get me wrong. Um, but anyway, yes, we have plenty of opportunity um, for you to kind of uh, get there, get settled do your grocery shopping, things like that. Obviously, um, again, as we've said, it is kind of quite an independent style of living and uh, kind of learning as well. So it's a great opportunity, basically, to be an adult because you will legally be one and, you know, do your own shopping, do your own cooking, do your own washing up and your clothes and everything like that. Um, and it does kind of give you that opportunity to really get stuck in into that life as an adult. Um, great, yeah. I don't know how we're doing for time. We might need to move to Q&A um, if anybody has any burning questions. Yes, yeah. yeah, you can go through clearing as an international student as well. Yeah, sure, sure, of course. So yeah, so you've applied for five programs at, let's say, five different universities, or it could have been three, and you did two in one and two in another. But anywho, and you hear back from all five of them, and unfortunately, you know, something happened, maybe you didn't get great grades or whatever, and you've had rejections from all five choices. What that then would mean is um, there's a period uh, in the UCAS process called clearing that normally starts at the start of July and then kind of peaks um, around mid-August when UK students get their A-level results. Um, and so UK students wouldn't kind of be finding out which university they're actually going to until those A-level results come out. And so kind of coinciding with that period then if you have students who haven't gotten any offers from any universities, they can also apply through clearing. And it's just kind of getting in touch with individual universities and saying, um, I didn't get any offers, these are the grades I have, would you have a place for me on this program? And then they can have a look and say, yep, yeah, you know what, we've still got room on that course, your grades, we can accept them, come on over. Um, but it's more of kind of like an individual um, conversation with universities. Sorry, yeah. So, because British students are waiting for the results and they've all received conditional offers or unconditional offers, that fantastic. If, 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 if you're applying from here, will, will the offers be solid once you get them? Like, or, or might it be conditional if you keep your grade points at this level, you will have a place? How, how, what, what so, yeah, yeah so, so you wouldn't be able to apply for a clearing place until you have your final results. So you um, yeah, exactly, yeah. Or whatever it is that they require. So if a university requires you to have APs and you've got your final AP results and your high school transcript, then, then you would be able to apply through clearing. So you wouldn't be able to go through clearing and get a conditional offer and wait for you to get those final results. With clearing, you'd have to have your final results in hand and then go to a university and say, you know, this is what I've got. These are the final results. What can you do for me? And 
and the proof of degree earned, and that he met the GPA requirement as well. So that would still be considered a degree earned. Thank you. 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 Thank I mean, yeah, I mean, obviously our universities, even between the four of us, are quite different. So for example, at Northumbria, um, we don't require students to have APs, SATs, or ACTs. We're very test flexible, so if they don't have any standardized tests, we can just look at their GPA. Whereas other institutions, I mean, if you guys want to talk about yours. Um, Liverpool, we're sort of somewhere in between where we um, do need some standardised testing, so we would like some APs, um, but we also are happy to look at things like honours classes, college courses, um, so we're kind of a bit happy to look at a, a mix and match approach as well. We don't necessarily directly translate from the A-level requirements into international qualifications. We recognise that international qualifications have merits in different ways, so um, you know that's why we're trying to be a little bit more flexible, and it's not just a case of that direct translation. So a 3A requirement for UK A-levels isn't necessarily three fives in AP. We're, we're a little bit different with that. So at Lancaster, for the majority of our courses, we do look for APs. Um, the caveat to that is that for our Faculty of Arts and Social Sciences, um, a lot of our courses there, we are looking at um, like, like honours um, instead uh, to have that little bit, bit of flexibility in. And at Sheffield, we do require the AP. So we're looking for minimum 3.0 GPA for final transcripts, proof of degree earned. And then in terms of the APs, basically we almost like have an internal chart. So you'll look at the A levels, come to us and say, okay, what is that? Um, what does that translate to? So are the three, um, are the three A's three fives? Um, what's the B versus four? So we basically will tell you then what you need. There was another question from this lady. Did you have a follow-up? I was just going to quickly follow up on that. So, so with regards to um, finding that information out, Often that information will be available on a university website, um, might even be by course or it might be on say a USA country page um, that gives you indication of the entry requirements. Um, if it's not available then contacting the admissions team or the country representative is the way to go to find out. In, you know specifically what you need but most universities will try this transparent entry requirements you know try and list them for you. major in chemistry and minor in English lit. So with the process that you've laid out, is there any place for minors or studying other things? So in the UK, many universities have what we call combined degrees, maybe joint honours. Usually a student can take, um, it might be 50%, so 50-50 or 75-25 split. What you will find that will be different though is that often the um, subject areas need to be within the same discipline. So you know, English lit and chemistry are probably not a combination that we can offer. Some universities might be more flexible, um, so you're more likely to find things like sciences that can be combined together, or maybe um, humanities or arts that could be combined together as well. So if anybody else wants to add to that. And another um, opportunity is to really look at the course offerings at each university because you might be like, oh, they have politics. But then if you look, they also have politics and international relations, politics and philosophy. So uh, the topics are almost combined into its own specific course as well. So there, and that's just one example, but that is something I think. Mm -hmm the bulk of us have too. Yeah, I mean, I did a both an undergraduate and a master's where I ended up having a major minor split and they were kind of, the title had two different components in it. And then just by choosing optional modules, I could then make it a kind of more focused on what at the time was cross-cultural communication with a minor in international relations. So there is flexibility, but it needs to be those kind of preset existing combinations. It's not as free. Mm -hmm. I think we had a question in the back. Uh, how does the student visa application work if you have like a dual citizenship with another country in Europe? So 
um, we each have an immigration team on campus that will be your go-to. And um, basically, it's it's a very neat, clean timeline for the most part. So essentially, um, let's just say it's a September intake you're looking at. So once summer hits and you hopefully meet unconditional offer, meaning you have proof of your graduation in, you have got all those A levels or whatever the requirements are, then you will be reached out to, the university will reach out and say, okay, it is time for the next steps. And that will include the term CAS, C-A-S, Confirmation of Acceptance of Studies. It's essentially a previous application. You will go through the steps. We, either our team or our immigration team will help you. And the CAS application is something that you will fill out with the university and then they will issue you a CAS ID and then you will take that and put it into your visa application that once again they will help you with the steps of how to do that on the VFS website and that CAS ID essentially tells them this university is confirming that this student is um, confirmed to place and will be studying with us, that they're almost sponsoring your visa, essentially. And then you will complete that process. And there, again, there will be someone to help you through all of the steps. And then there might be options, depending on your nearest location, of timeline of can you pay for an accelerated to get your visa within a week or two, maybe even less than a week, versus typically you're looking at um, around a four to five week turnaround but don't forget in the UK our classes don't start our semester term doesn't start um, until um, end of September so uh, I know lots of times once July hits it's like I have no time at all I need to be there around Labor Day but you don't so it is it does work out for our students for the timeline I hope that works I, I think is your question do you have British citizenship is a uh, dual nationality or European Polish. Oh, okay, yeah. yeah. So obviously, since Brexit, um, European citizens also need to now have a student visa. So, um, you know, regardless of whether you would be kind of coming in on a US passport or a European passport, for both of those, you would now require a student visa and go through the same process that um, Haley has just referred to. Oh, sorry, I misheard yeah. the question. No problem. Uh, yeah. Oh. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> Around if any money that's saved in a 529 account, can that be used in the UK or is that only able to use it in the US? I don't know what that is. <laughs> <laughs> so the 529 saving plans typically can be used. It'll just be that you'll want to reach out to the finance team at the university and see how will they accept it. Because sometimes it might be you need to figure out how do you have to then transfer it to your own personal account here in the U.S. and then do a wire transfer. Because lots of times the families in the U.S. are paying a wire transfer to their certain account or, you know, however the finance team is accepting your tuition and fees um, if it's not coming via a loan, a bank specifically. So you'll just basically ask them, hey, I've got this external funds. They might know the term 529, and then you'll work it out if you'll have to transfer yourself or if they'll accept a check in the mail from the bank and so on. I hope that helps. Yep. Thank you. Are there any requirements? Uh, for example, here my daughter will finish at 17. Can she enter school there? Oh, okay. some, some, some courses course. will have um, an age minimum age requirement. So clinical programs like medicine, the student would need to be 18 when they start the course. Um, the most universities will take students who are well 17 generally. You know, not much younger than that. Um, there may be some restrictions once they arrive to university. For example, with things like consumption of alcohol, they can still join in social activities, but wouldn't be able to because it would be illegal. Um, so we do have students who are younger than 18 who join our campuses, but some courses might have restrictions. Yeah, I think I would just add that at least at Northumbria, when a student applies and we can see from their date of birth that they're going to be younger than 18, we would then just reach out and get them to fill in a little bit more paperwork in terms of having consent from their kind of carer or parent, um, and then just put in a little bit of extra support in place so that we know that they're coming in as a minor still. Is it will have to pay international student fees because three years residency prior to study is necessary. If, from our own personal circumstances, we were to go back but would not have completed three years before entering university, would that would home student fees kick in after the required three years or do you have to do the whole course 
uh, the international studies. So um, not no, necessarily no. For, for any of that. Um, the, the fee status um, is not solely linked with the three-year residency in the UK. There are things like taxes and property, and there's lots of detail in what we send out as a fee status questionnaire. So there's no kind of easy answer, um, definitive answer in that sense. Um, but we do have... Um, so there are sometimes students who... Um, I know from some cases the student might have spent two years in the UK. They get they apply because they finish their schooling, get an offer, and then they de defer and delay their start date for another year so that they can get the three-year period. Obviously, not kind of promoting that um, as a as a way to do it, but you know, there. I think um, it, the best thing to do is actually um, inquire with the universities that you're interested in. We send out these fee status questionnaires, um, but. There is another resource you can use. Um, it's uh, the UK Council for International Student Affairs, uh, UKCISA. Happy to kind of tell you about that later. Um, but they have uh, a lot of universities refer to their guidance on fee status um, and apply that when they are assessing the applicants that they have. Does anybody else mm -hmm. want to add to that? If I were to take a foundation year and a sandwich year, and it would make five years, is that like would it be allowed to do that? Or mm -hmm. Yeah, yeah, we do. do. We sometimes list courses on our websites that are five years in total for that reason. Um, and note that the uh, if you do take it, say a placement year or a study abroad year, then um, the the tuition is much reduced for that year because you're not on campus. But there's obviously you're still registered at the university, still receiving university support. But the tuition is usually much reduced for that year as well. Sure. So a foundation year is for students who haven't quite met the academic requirement in order to directly start year one of a bachelor's degree. Perhaps they've come from a different education system that doesn't um, give them the full um, uh, level of study to be able to start at bachelor's level. Um, as you've heard from us today, the, the US is, is not typically um, a, a education system which would require a foundation unless, for example, there are certain subject areas that you've not um, studied before that you would require for your degree. So if maybe you are required, a university requires you to have um, an AP in a mathematics subject because you want to study engineering. If you don't have that, you may be able to do a foundation year. Sometimes it's also linked with performance. So if you have not quite met the grades or got the results that you need to get into your first choice university, then that university may offer you a foundation as an alternative in order to kind of upskill you ready for that year one of the, um, the bachelor's degree. They can be. Uh, um, some universities will automatically offer it as a kind of, well, you don't quite meet the requirements, but we do have this foundation. Um, other universities, um, may you may have to kind of request that and say, I recognise I might not meet the criteria. Can I apply for the foundation? Because some foundations in the UK are also linked with English language mm -hmm. training as well. So it's worth checking that the university has a foundation, which is, you know, the academic um, transition, the bridge period, or whether it's actually offered as a, a more of an English transition as well. Can you do a foundation year at one university but then get a bachelor's at another university? You can. We would prefer that you don't. If you were coming to us for a foundation, we'd rather that you continued your full studies at our university, but that does happen. Yeah, that, that does happen. Does every school offer um, integrated foundation years? Or do only some schools? Um, because it's coming up with all universities. Yeah, yeah, we have all, yeah. 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 The only thing I was going to add about the visa question was, and I don't know if you guys know any different, but you are limited in the number of years you can get a student visa for. So obviously there is some flexibility built into it in case you fail a year and you need to repeat a year. But if you were doing a foundation and then a four-year undergraduate degree, you would most likely be kind of reaching that maximum length you could be doing it. So obviously it's just something to bear in mind that it then doesn't give you that kind of buffer year in case you don't pass a year, which obviously can get tricky, but uh, it's just something to bear in mind. Thank you so much. Yeah. A lot of times the, the terminology gets confusing yeah. and the language itself. I've always heard that it's our greatest problem between the two of us is the language because they have such different terms. But I, I know you'll all be available to help with all of that.